Ben. And uh, I'm an academic lecturer from the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. And uh, at the moment, I'm over here in the United States uh, working at uh, George Washington University um, in the Department of Media and uh, Public Affairs. And um, I'm working on a few different books and uh, over here doing research, mostly around the recent election, 2016 elections. Um, but basically my focus is uh, propaganda and political communication. Uh, so I've got a couple of books already. One of them, uh, the first book uh, co-authored with the Glasgow Media Group, where I did my PhD uh, in sociology, was um, uh, Bad News for Refugees, and that looks at um, the uh, the ways in which um, refugees are represented in the media and how negatively they're um, represented and the impacts that that has on uh, communities. Um, so how that affects uh, both refugees and um, black minority ethnic uh, communities in the UK as well as um, white British communities. So um, we looked at that as well as uh, like talking to journalists and things. And I also have another book which looks at propaganda and counter-terrorism. So for that um, I examined the um, uh, changes taking place after 9-11 up until uh, just recently really, uh, 2014 um, uh, and how propaganda was being redeveloped and coordinated and expanded uh, by the British and American governments. So I conducted interviews with people from the CIA, from Pentagon, uh, from the State Department and the White House and was it, it hard attaining the clearances? Oh yeah. <laughs> okay, I would imagine. <laughs> well, I was uh, a little British girl, you know, and um, you, you, you know, I kind of got told by um, a lot of people that you know you can't do that. You know, they won't talk to you. That you need to find another methodology. Um, you know, it's a man's world. <laughs> and. Um, you know, and also the, because they don't want to talk about these things, you know, it's hard to get information out of people. Um, but I found um, trial and error a little bit, you know, I kind of um, developed my methodology and my approach and so on. And the first interview I did, I didn't get very far, but the person was forthcoming, but they weren't going to tell me their secrets. And you know what I mean? They, yeah. there was, they were not really very frank. Um, but they introduced me to other people and I sort of networked that way and when you've won someone's kind of respect and their um, uh, you know they introduce you to somebody else then that person assumes oh this person has been recommended to me and they're also wondering what the last person said about them oh, a little yes, bit definitely. and they want to get their story in you know it's so it's you you juicy. build it up yeah exactly and you manage to get you know um, better and better interviews and you know now I've I've done some of the most interesting interviews I've done have been with uh, people um, were who were you know working with the presidents and working directly uh, for the um, I, I, I interviewed a couple of weeks ago the former director of national intelligence which was quite exciting and I've I've interviewed people who've gone through trauma and it's I mean the whole I, I, I even interviewed somebody who started laughing about torture in one interview I mean it's sometimes you never know what to expect it's shocking sometimes and I didn't expect that at all. I wasn't even asking about torture, and they suddenly started talking about it in those ways. So, Maybe it's, uh, something they need to get off. Yeah, head, yeah. Uh, but the the methodology and how you, I, I don't know. I, I think I also um, I really enjoy that because it feels like an achievement to try and um, uh, you know find out what people don't know. And and it's not just about it's not journalism as such because I'm not I'm not a journalist, but I'm. Um, I, th I think the the reason that I get talked to is because I'm an academic. I think a lot of people wouldn't be speaking to journalists, you know, so they trust me more. 
there's no big splash going to be on the newspapers tomorrow. I'll go away, think about it, and then, you know, analyse it in an academic way. And I think people have a greater sense of trust. So I think, you know, that's, that's helpful as well. Um, but also you do just have to be quite a good interviewer, you know, and it's, it's really hard to get, uh, to win people's trust and respect uh, when it comes to uh, subjects like this. And, you know, regardless of whether they trust you or respect you, you know, these kinds of people are trained to uh, twist information, spin it, and sometimes deceive. So you have to be really aware of that. Um, I'm very much out to change the world and that was my entire motivation for getting into academia. You know, I think there are real injustices and um, I feel that we don't have, um, I don't know, I feel like it's a really urgent problem, the problem of um, misinformation and, um, and now, propaganda. Speaking of misinformation. Yeah. With the internet and the fake news and the ability for you and I to go on Twitter and just post anything that looks like a news and just mm -hmm. pay two dollars or fifty cents mm -hmm. and promote it, mm -hmm. how how do how does real news survive? Mm -hmm. And how can people become educated to know the difference between well, fake and the real? first thing? I mean, I I'm not worried about you and I mm -hmm. being able to post an advert, you know, mm -hmm. on on Facebook um, and promote, you know. Uh, the, you know, some ordinary person isn't going to be putting fake news out there, and if they yeah. do, it's not going to circulate. Yeah. Um, it's the, the thing that worries me. Are, you know, companies that have been recently in the media, like Cambridge Analytica, and uh, also um, some sections of the government who are putting out um, propaganda. Which, well, you know, in particular, okay. So the Cambridge Analytica example. I think you know. One of the most um, urgent problems is how um, our data is currently being used. So, um, for instance, intelligence agencies are able to drag in um, our data, anonymize it, but the amount that you can find out from like open data now is huge. And they use that then to target propaganda at different groups. Now, um, the same kinds of information, the openly available information, uh, can be used by private companies for campaigning, political campaigning. And this is what Cambridge Analytica have done. So not using, you know, um, surveillance as such, but using openly available data which they can buy, which includes your, you know, Facebook likes and so on. Now that seems like it's not really that big a deal because everybody is like on Facebook. They're not really worrying about having liked a page, but from like just a very few, very small number of likes, they can find out huge amounts of information about you and really kind of profile you and know more about you than you know about yourself. It's unbelievable. So um, technology is advancing so quickly that um, it seems likely at this point that they are able to, I mean, the, the technologies are a little black box, so it's very difficult to know for certain how far they've got, but it seems likely that they have managed to combine that with, um, with targeting um, propaganda in, through pushing out ads, what they call dark advertising, so things that can't be traced, that you don't know are coming up in people's, and they've been very heavily targeted, and what they can do then is, is kind of um, uh, measure how much, um, you know, they can target very careful messaging at particular types of people, so all across the country. And then, depending on the, how that person then responds to that, they can do little experiments on you and basically target you with something different that's more effective next time. Um, and the if you look at how the media, um, the sort of uh, right wing and um, centrist. Uh, media nexuses developed over the last sort of year or so it looks 
increasingly divided. So you have a, a very far right wing bubble of people who have very few other sources. And this is extremely scary. They are not looking at the mainstream media. They are looking at Breitbart and its little, you know, satellites. Um, and you have huge, you know, billionaires who have been financing these kinds of campaigns. And companies like Cambridge Analytica are amplifying hate, essentially. And why do you think that is? Why do you think hate is... Why not love? Why, why don't I not see? <laughs> you know, like, wh why is it always... Oscar Obama <laughs> I haven't seen too many love propaganda. You know, I've seen a lot of... There is love propaganda. Oh, there is? Oh, okay. Of course there is. I mean, okay, so people... Yeah, well, you know, I have a... Reporting. I had a, you know, I had a pussy hat. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, I think no, people, exactly. you know, the left are putting out their, their love propaganda. But the trouble is that they're not... They don't have the um, media infrastructure that the right wing do. So if you look at, um, there was uh, an article in um, Columbia Journalism Review and they did what are called media clouds. And you can see, this is this year, this is like a month, less than a month ago, a few weeks ago, yeah. Um, they did a media cloud. So basically you have all of the dots of, of all the, um, uh, mainstream media and that was what was being followed by the um, Democrats then there's a big big little um, cyclone of, of uh, right-wing very right-wing sort of uh, info wars and Breitbart and all these kinds of crazy the, the, the <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Um, very disturbing and I've seen stuff, a lot of my relatives which was full of fake news and and those were you know massively more retweeted than the um, uh, than, than fake news that was uh, on the Hillary Clinton kind of and Bernie Sanders kind of uh, left-wing um, account the right wing got all these bots so they were kind of like reproducing this stuff and really spreading it and they also have figured out how to work with Google so that their kind of searches come up um, as suggestions so more they quickly they ha they have a very clever people. yeah networking yeah. throughout our media systems so they have smart people <laughs> oh they really do and, and it's crazy and yeah. and so there's this big mainstream there's this right wing mm -hmm. i guess it should be around the other way for the camera yeah. <laughs> but there's no left wing bubble at all <laughs> And why do you think there's no left-wing bubble? There are a few media organizations and, and little blogs, there's Democracy Now, there's, but they don't connect and, and actually circulate and build and, and the uh, Democrats haven't supported them. So if you look at the right-wing bubble, it has support, been supported yeah, by rich... Well, obviously when Donald Trump yeah. got... You know, Absolutely, fans. that I was owning because you ha it was piecework. You had a big box you had to fill in a certain amount of time, and and I, I was quite slow at filling the box apparently. And I ended up earning, I think it was one pound an hour or something. It was so little that it was not worth me going back. <laughs> so, how long did you work there? Only a few days, I think. <laughs> I also uh, sold double glazing, <laughs> and I. Uh, <laughs> I worked in the motorsport industry for a while. <laughs> I've done all sorts of things. I think your book would be interesting if you did a bio on your life. Oh, well, that hasn't come up yet, but I have a, an autobiographical short story that I'm kind of currently working on. Uh, what is that called? That's the one you read. That was um, oh, oh that one. <laughs> oh, we're, no, yeah, no, we're recording again. I'm you forgetting. Didn't, you didn't yeah. tell me that. Now yeah, I'm going to look at it in a different lens. Yeah. I thought it was just something good that you wrote. Now it's I, called Land of Hope and Glory. Okay. For, well, for the now audience. I'm going to read it. And now <laughs> picture you. Then, yeah, yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. I'm the friend, not the person in the hospital. Okay. But yeah. Okay, it sounded like it was you. But I didn't know if it was a Like, you know how some people, they write it? Like, it felt yeah. like you. I yeah. don't know how to... Well, I don't use the name, but it's, yeah, basically, yeah, autobiographical. It's the most autobiographical thing I've ever written. And most of, most of my um, fiction is fiction. <laughs> you know, I don't tend to what do... What about Bite Down? 
Uh, that is about a little girl, I think, who is basically. I mean, it's. I guess it's slightly autobiographical as well, because the, the first lines and I. But it's really not as I well. I tried to write okay. the first lines down because I wanted people okay, to hear. Okay, go for it. But I don't remember them. You don't but, remember them. Okay, don't but worry. The first lines with the, the visuals of the person biting on the sofa. Yeah. The girl, yeah. And the mom saying you shouldn't said what you said. Yeah, because somebody how you, you somebody it. did this to me. Like, and you uh, okay, it so to a, the a kid. Dentist. Yeah. In that. Yeah. And you said someone did that to you? Some, someone did wash my mouth out with soap when I was a kid. But it wasn't your mom? No. Okay. But and it's a completely different story. It wasn't for those reasons, and you know. But that that beginning part felt so real. Yeah, exactly, because I, like, I I have experienced that. So that so. It felt like it came from a real place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah, know yeah, about yeah. the mom and the whatever, but the yeah. way you started it out and the way you described it, yeah, yeah, people yeah. need to read Bite Down. And okay. Africa. They need cool. to read it. So if y'all listening, you need to read it. <laughs> but, but yeah. But yeah. I I have a I like that story. I do. I but I I also I think it's a little bit different for me cuz it has a punchy ending, which I don't usually do. I tend not to do story arc kind of thing, you know. Um I like endings that just sort of thud and leave you thinking rather than having a proper conclusion. Gotcha. And that why one has a proper conclusion. Why? Why? I'll tell you why. Because I, I sent it to my friend and it didn't end that way. And he was like, it needs an ending. I want a powerful ending. And I'm like, oh well. And I told him, I'm not going to spoil it for your, re- for okay, your yeah, listeners. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I sent this jokingly to him. Yeah. And then he was like, oh my god, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I read it again, and I'm like, oh, you know, it kind of does work. <laughs> and I like how you're so. So it was kind of un- unexpected, and I was like, you know, fuck it, I like it. <laughs> but yeah, but I felt like it maybe um, gives it an edge that I didn't. It- Expect there to be in the story, but uh, you know, like sometimes the the characters and the situations take themselves forward, you know, and it's not about me, <laughs> you know. So it's it's kind of okay. It, no, I really love it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and I don't want to be a fan girl. And mm-hmm. not, not to say that feminism is bad, mm-hmm. but I'm paraphrasing. Fan guy. Yeah. But that's something I fan guy fan girl about. <laughs> Okay, so cool. The way you wrote it, I was like, oh, I wish I could write like that. <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to talk about Bite Down. So, you got a diploma in literature and creative writing from yeah. Open University. Yeah, the Open University in the UK, which is like the biggest university in the UK. Okay. It's absolutely fantastic. And where is it located? It's not. For people who don't know? It's, an, it's a... It's it's been around for for generations it's like a very very long heritage kind of um uh correspondence school mm-hmm. and um i think it was set up in maybe the 60s or 70s maybe probably the 60s actually um and it's it's a very old established very well respected correspondence school so i did like an online degree course or the portion of it that was like I wanted to do, which was basically uh, giving me a diploma in creative writing and literature, and it was so fantastic. I mean, a lot of these correspondence schools, you know, uh, were set up since then, and they are, are they a bit than of what, what they are here, like in America. Yeah, I think there are a lot of these that have been set up as a bit of a money maker for the universities because, you know, a lot of people they can't get to a you know go can't go and enroll on a university course and you know some of some of these kinds of fake universities were set up that aren't really very respected and you you have to i mean correspondence courses are really good but they have to be organized well and i think sometimes they're not very well organized sometimes they're not really respected institutions so I think you have to pick the university well, go to something that is really, you know, respected, and then they're very, very good. But unfortunately, I think they, they still charge people a lot of money a lot of the time yeah, they do. 
the um, the one that I went to, the Open University, it's almost run like it's almost a charity. It is so well organized and it's very, very cheap, um, but very high quality and very respected. It will get you into graduate programs and so on. And the teaching is fantastic. You can attend actual classes as well as, you know, getting, you know, real feedback from a real person you know because a lot of these uh, correspondence courses all they do is give you kind of um, automated reactions and things like this there's no real person that you can talk to so you felt like at Open University you have a real connection oh yeah it's just as good as a real university kind of thing um, but uh, done through you know the online environment and you have forums where you can discuss the work with other students and interact it was absolutely brilliant for a, um, a writing course for me and the the standard of um, education is fantastic I mean you've got you know really wonderful writers who come through the open university and scientists and all kinds of really cool people um, but uh, yeah I mean I, I consider it probably one of the best writing courses to do in the country actually um, there are a lot of MFAs that um, you can do but in terms of value for money and things like that it's it's really excellent and they they support you to do writing that is more left field that isn't necessarily uh, following the rules you know um, and I think that's really important because okay you have to learn the rules in order to break them but they are quite supportive of people who want to do things in a you know slightly different way which I was quite interested in with my work yeah so I had a really great experience on my writing course but that said you don't need to do a writing course in order to be a writer some people it helps build the confidence and I needed to do that I think um, and, okay, so off topic. Yeah. Because you said you felt real connections at Open University. And mm -hmm. kind of segue way into, um, I always ask every person I interview, what does love mean to you? Love? Yes. And this is off topic, but you're talking about real connections. And I always okay. ask, what does love mean to you? So this is totally off field. But you seem like you had a real connection at Open University. Well, yeah, but and I want to know. Exactly <laughs> I wouldn't it call it love. <laughs> that's a stretch. But that's the only way I could feel. I could. I could have bring it in propaganda. I could have talked about it then, but I can talk about it now. Okay. Well, maybe love is propaganda. <laughs> maybe love is propaganda. <laughs> oh no! I, I oh, I'm from, I don't even know how to respond to that. That is a strange one. Um, what is love? And you know how to, you can do the open open university way. Come yeah. Left field if you want. But I don't know. Yeah. I, okay. Love. Love. Love is the deepest trust, and love is the strongest strongest emotion. This is knowing that someone will be there for you and knowing that you would give anything for that person it's it's having someone and I think it's so elusive unfortunately it's very very hard to find <laughs> Is that okay? No, that's fine. It's trust and being there. Yeah. It's trust that's I think invested I... in something that isn't gonna, isn't. And you're the first person that is tangible. It's that you know when I think I think in order to love someone, you have to let go and you have to be vulnerable, and you have to say right, that's it. You have the hardest thing to give away. And um, and you share that, and I think that it's it's about trust and it's about communication. And if you don't, if one of those goes, it's the most painful and the most destroying thing in our world. I think. Who's your favorite person you've met in your lifetime that's influenced you? Like, 
influenced me. Okay. Not even influenced you, but you're like, huh, that person's intriguing. Person. Can I can I have two people? Yeah, two people. Yeah, that's fine. Uh when I when I moved from England where I did my first degree up to Scotland where I did my subsequent education and I lived there for 11 years and oh, I really loved it. yeah wow. Glasgow uh, I met a number of really cool people in Scotland um, but one person in particular who um, was probably the first person I've ever completely trusted and that realizing that um, not everyone is out for themselves realizing that um, there are people who have a more collectivist kind of approach to life like I always felt we should um, and realizing there are people who care about their community who are willing to give time for nothing to to try and make the world a better place and, and even just small little things for people I it, it made such a difference to my life so there was one person in particular who I I got to know who um, showed me the world in a completely new way and made me see that um, material things were were shit that my degree was a bit of paper and honestly I kind of feel like this you know that my degree is a bit of paper what you take from it what, what really is important is what you learned how you changed as a person um, that stuff you don't need to go to a university for necessarily but but it helps but the the, the trouble is we cherish these bits of paper, these kinds of symbols of that. You know, the reality of, of an education is really important, but the way that we reify or kind of build up these kinds of symbols as status, as so important, as I'm better than you because, you know, I have this bit of paper. You know, if you have the knowledge, you have the, the heart, the experience, the you know, maturity, the, you know, two people are equal, you know, and, and I kind of re realized that I had spent a lot of my life kind of um, desperately trying to prove something that really all I need is, is me and what's inside me and that to be good and to feel that, um, the experience of the world is what's important and how you are in it not these kinds of things that we count on our CV or we you know measure those things are meaningless and I, I, I realized that there are so many people in this world who I can have faith in and you know what that that is more important than anything it's that feeling that you know um, I, I, I can have some optimism I can have some hope when when you find people that are like that you know because I, I knew a lot of selfish people before that time I knew a lot of people who made my life very difficult as well and it made me realize that actually there's hope in this world that was really important to me the second person is an academic who I know and you know I kind of you kind of expect a lot of the time when you meet academics that they're gonna be in ivory towers and very you know um, full of themselves or something or you know they're very um, arrogant I kind of I, I I contacted this particular professor from the UK who I admired his work. It's a very wonderful um, study of, of power. And honestly, the, the book blew my mind. I was, I was so impressed by it. And I thought, oh my, I really want to meet this person. So I felt quite, you know, um, intimidated by, by his awesomeness. 
<laughs> and I decided I'm gonna write. I, I, I did so the email. email. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, I have this really great idea for research. Can I talk to you about it? And he actually emailed me back, and I was so excited. And then I, I went over and I took, I did a, a class for him, and I spoke to his students, and and I got to meet him. And I was in such a shaky, you know, I was so, it was like meeting a celebrity. I know it sounds really silly because no, it's just it's an not, academic, I, but, you know, like I've it's, but it's, oh my God, I really admire him and his work. And he was this um, wonderful guy who had absolutely no ego at all. See, you had the best experience. I met some people I admire. It was so nice. And he was. He, he's the sort of person who speaks to his students like they are absolutely equals. He does not, you know, you see him interact with them and he doesn't correct them as such. He moves them towards expand, you know, developing their own ideas. So he'll ask them questions. You know, they clearly have got something bloody wrong. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can see that they have. And instead of saying, no, that's wrong, you know, it's this, he will ask them a question that enables them to think a bit further and come up with, oh, so it's this, you know, and they'll get it themselves. And watching their brains work and watching him, you know, not in any way condescend, not in any way, you know, it's, it's, it's almost, if, for those students, they probably can't see him do it, but I know that they've said something wrong and I can see what he's doing. It's so inspiring because it's so respectful and it's it's absolutely the best way to teach. And so I, I think that person inspires me greatly. Do you apply, I know you're a lecturer too. Yeah. And you lectured at, is it Sheffield? It? Yes, Sheffield University. I've also lectured at um, Glasgow University and uh, in Scotland. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'm sorry if I get my orientations off. And the University of West of Scotland, as well as a couple of universities here. So I've been lecturing a little bit at, at George Washington University here as well. So do you apply any of his techniques? Do you try to? I try to do that. It's a skill. It's really hard. I do it as much as I possibly can. The trouble is a lot of um, new teachers. Mm -hmm. I think. I'm very nervous a lot of the time, and they talk too much. And what he does, I mean, it's wonderful. He he holds himself back and allows the students to speak. So this this was uh, Professor Stephen Lukes, and I think he is quite phenomenal. <laughs> you hear that, Stephen Lukes? Phenomenal. <laughs> and what Stephen Lukes, um, if I not recall, did he not um, co-sign one of your books or like said something positive about it? He has. He's been very supportive. Um, well, that's cool that you not only got to meet someone who inspired you, but they also supported yeah. your endeavors. I mean, is that surreal? Yeah, it's really. Oh my God, it was so incredible. Like, I, I was so he, flattered. You know, I, I meant to have. I what flattered he said. is the wrong word, but you know, he is. Um, you know, it's not just him. There's been a number of wonderful academics who've supported my work, and. You know, I kind of, um, I'm here at the moment working with um, uh, Professor Robert Entman at George Washington University, who's also been incredibly supportive. And, you know, I wouldn't, this this whole year, I've been here in Washington, D.C. I feel like my my life has expanded, my world has expanded. I've, I've had so many incredible opportunities, and it's all thanks to him, you know, and people, so how did he find you, or how did you find this opportunity in Washington, D.C.? I never got to ask you that. Like, how did you even come, like, out of all places, you I wrote him an email again. Oh, so you wrote this particular person? Yeah, and told him I liked his work, and, you know, I'm, I'm interested in what he's doing, and... Well, I need to see your emails, because every person you write to... <laughs> receives, you must be a very well... Explainer of things. I mean, I've been writing emails for a while with my research. I mean, if you think about it with the um, interviewing, I mean, you have to approach people, so I know how to approach people. But that makes me sound really manipulative, which is not what it is, because these are people that I admire, you know? So you wanna, you wanna... But the fact that you've got people that you admire. But you have to convince you. them, so you have to approach it in a particular way, of course, but, you know, 
at the same time, I think. And, and so when you responded in a positive way, how did you feel about coming to DC? Very excited. <laughs> I love Washington, D.C. And I, oh my, I can't believe that I'm actually staying in this neighborhood again. Mm -hmm. I was living in um, Alexandria in Del Rey in 2009 when I came over to do my um, research for my PhD. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. So I have all of my friends around me right. and it's the most wonderful place. I love it here. And it's such a great community. People are lovely. It's um yeah, there's so many kind people. It's so, it's so friendly. I, I remember I walked into, you know, shops and and bars in, in Delray, you know, back in two thousand and nine and I still know those people. You know, it's wow. amazing. It's I still know I have all the same friends and um, it's it's great and I, I feel like I've met so many new people this time as well you know and um, the opportunities that seem to be happening from it I mean I've, I've even managed to get people interested in making a documentary um, based on the kind of work I'm doing which is pretty cool <laughs> it's I don't know whether it's gonna happen or not no, because it's, it's a very difficult commissioning pr uh, process but we're aiming at trying to maybe get a documentary into the BBC which would be pretty cool Okay. about American propaganda and um, Russia I as think well. it's a matter of time before it translates because Ooh. I don't know if people know people need to know about this stuff um, your work made into the, what's it, the Washington Post yeah. recently so I do think people, once people are finding out yeah. about you they are receiving mm -hmm. you because mm -hmm. you are tackling subjects that people need to know so I can't wait till that document comes out yeah yeah, I also have a couple of book chapters coming up. One on uh, surveillance, human rights, and the media. You said book chapters. Yeah, so, okay, and so in collections. Are they coming up within like what's up, the next six months or? It's next month, basically. Next month, okay. Yeah, in the next month or two. Yeah, so a um, couple new publications. I, I share them all on my website, which I'm sure you'll put out there as well. Yes, I definitely will put the website in. <laughs> you can say it to the people. Yeah, it's Emma Dash Bryant. B R I A N T. Uh, dot co dot uk and, and your your page says the uh, the maven of persuasion you came up with that <laughs> yes title. yes you did i did okay. <laughs> well you try to find something fun <laughs> yeah it's i you know it's very hard to come up with a, a web page i don't really know how you do all that you stuff. developed it yourself yeah <laughs> i don't know if it's very good but <laughs> hey it's enough to get all these people involved in your process yeah. Attention and Are you gonna have mind. a website? Yeah. <laughs> wow, I'm. I like playing about with it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like seeing what you're doing, and I don't mean to be a stalker, but <laughs> I was like, you do so much, and I, just, mm. I, I try not to like all your pictures <laughs> and everything you post. Yep. But, uh, I really like everything you do. Mm, thank you. Well, at the moment, I'm working on a new book um, with Bob Entman, who I just mentioned, um, uh, which is looking at the Democrats uh, during the recent election and what went wrong for their political communication strategy. So I, I see it as, as particularly um, a, a really particularly important failure. Um, from, uh, from George Washington, George Washington University. Washington, yeah. yeah. So a lot of people have pointed to the uh, conflicts of interest uh, deep within the um, elite of the Democrats, um, which have um, led to them really not addressing the problem of economic inequality, which really has led to the tensions which were exploited by Donald Trump in this recent election. But um, they also have an really um, and a closely interrelated problem is their problem of, of communicating on that topic. So they fail to get across the message of economic inequality. Is? Well, because they are, um, well, a little bit, but but not so much as the the Republicans oh, yeah, are. That's what I'm saying. It's, so it's weird that Republicans the Republicans have actually managed to brand them as as an elite, which is weird. Well. You know they kind of are but not to the same degree you know so but the trouble is it's like it's propaganda so you deflect um you know responsibility yeah, onto the other that said you know they they certainly have been elitist in some senses so what they really need to do is to uh get rid of these conflicts of interest but also um change their communication so that it um 
it's a little bit more consistent with the interests of the people because at the moment you know they can't say certain things because they seem uh, like they are hedging a little you know um, they can't seem hypocritical and they can't seem you know because they're taking loads of money from Wall Street gotcha. they're not able to really advocate for the interests of the people yeah, I just saw that Bernie Sanders yeah, yeah, yeah. identifying as independent yeah well he, he was before oh he was oh, yeah and then yeah. he went and became the Democrat and then he yes yeah, so he's gone back to being independent so that that's yeah like, that seems not to have the well, that's the trouble because though. there hasn't been, you know, there's a whole lot of people who haven't really had a voice for a long time. And the, um, you know, those people were not supported by the Democrats. And I think the Democrats need to get in touch with their, you know, grassroots and really start to listen to people and listen to their needs because otherwise they're, I mean, at the moment they have no kind of, um, anti-authoritarian and um, anti-establishment left at all and I'm not saying that that needs to be what gets elected but if you don't have the grassroots left then you you don't have a debate on the left and the right has this kind of very far right thrust and there's like a debate going on there but like unfortunately what they're doing is rebranding people who had become very right-wing you know the Republican Party of old was much more kind of mainstream it's almost what the Democrats are now so it's become really radical like the quite radical people have become the mainstream of the <laughs> of the Republicans so and so we, we we have a whole chunk of, of political possibilities that are not even being explored at the moment so this is really a problem for democracy associate what city is your home city do you feel personally is your home city I feel that Glasgow is my home but I don't have yeah okay. Scotland so that's your home yeah for me yeah so but being a person mm-hmm that's so obviously you've been in countries that are associated yeah. with the EU. How do you feel about where you were teaching, the country where you were teaching, and their decision with the Brexit? I was horrified and very upset. Um, I, th I think, okay, there are a lot of problems with the EU. Um, and the economic liberalization and the ways in which um, uh, migration can um, be used to sort of exploit migrant workers um, where you know they're kind of being paid very little money and and so on and I you know I, I think there are real problems with um, the kind of democracy of the EU but unfortunately you know like it's not perfect but it has created it has held peace in Europe for a long time and it also offers us a lot of opportunities a lot of money going to our deprived communities the people who voted for Brexit are the people who benefited most from Brexit unfortunately um, and it's it's really gonna hurt us I mean it already is um, it especially also um, can be quite destabilizing. I mean, the, the campaign for Brexit was really horrifying. I mean, it was very racist and it was very um, misinformed. <laughs> actually, actually, it was just full of lies. I will I will use the L word. Um, the, the propaganda was, was, was horrifying. Um, and it, it split people. It was very divisive. Um, it raised an awful lot of tensions, which I don't think were really there before. Um, but we have been building and building uh, this kind of very right-wing um, anti-immigration movement um, which started out very small and it certainly wasn't coming from the public as such. It was being amped up through uh, the media, through um, populist kind of like widely distributed media, um, the tabloids in the UK. And with the French elections coming up, yeah. 
how do you, you feel like okay, music. you think London no, is, or not London the UK is volatile this is going to affect the French election and even with the United States going through what they're going to do well I'm scared that the same kind of people who were messing in uh, the Brexit were, will be messing in those elections I mean these people know each other and did you watch the debate the, the Brexit people know the people who are connected to Trump's administration and his campaign okay. you know they are the same people who were running those kinds of campaigns they were all knowing each other and you know working together at the sounds of it so um, what worries me is if they also know people in France and it does seem like these kinds of groups know each other quite well and, and are connected I don't, I don't have you know evidence for that but there does seem to be um, a lot of circumstantial factors which are pointing to it um, so that's one thing that worries me. Also what worries me is um, the likelihood of the United Kingdom breaking apart. Now I, I would actually support Scottish independence if they went for that because I think they've been really messed over by Brexit. Scotland didn't vote for Brexit, it was almost completely against Brexit and has been is being forced to go through the Brexit by England, really. So, yeah, so it's very divided. Um, and the, Scotland hasn't been treated well as part of the United Kingdom anyway for quite a long time. So, well, <laughs> our entire history. Yeah, that's so, a, that's a <laughs> so, so, yeah, that worries yeah. me. Also, the um, Ireland. Um, Ireland and Northern Ireland are going to be the new Schengen border. So this means that basically the they will be the border to Europe. So people have families that are split between Northern Ireland and, and Republic of Ireland. And this means that they're now, you know, it's, it makes it much harder for families to see each other, to, to cross the border. And, um, you know, because they have to actually go through customs now. And also they, um, they now have, they're now, because they're now going to be the border with Europe, the immigration controls on the border with Europe are going to be huge so they're also going to be you know policing that border very very heavily in case of supposed illegal migrants and all this kind of crap so it's gonna it's I I think that the Irish are not going to be very happy with that and I could I could actually see Northern Ireland leaving the the UK as well I could see the whole of the UK breaking apart and then you've got other um, parts of Europe where se separatist kind of movements are taking place so if you look at Spain they have their own separatist movements if you know parts of the UK split off then that kind of inspires other groups to do the same and I think it also inspires people to try and leave the EU and you've all, you know this is basically playing into Russia's hands um, it's what Russia has been trying to fuel when it has been stoking the far right in Europe. And I think these are very, very dangerous forces that we really need to be very aware of. Um, I am quite scared about the prospect of conflict in Europe. Yeah. Well, one good? of the things that really upsets me is if you look at the media here, a lot of the time they talk about Russian people as, you know, like they're part of the problem well you know cultures are all have their problems don't get me wrong yeah. but but um they seem to be unable often to separate the people from the state the Russians. and yeah and that, that bothers me every time i hear it, the Russians. yeah like well and also i mean the, the way that they talk about um their support for putin and so on the way that they talk about those people is like they are stupid and they are, you know, um, ignorant idiots and so forth. And you know what? We are all having problems with um, <laughs> ignorance in our societies. Um, and you know what? Like, look at Chicago. Chicago yeah. So much but. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's very important to separate people. the people of a country from from its politics. Not every, and I say that to bring that one person up because there are people. They, uh, oh my God, but 
also in in my country you know I think we are horribly arrogant towards Americans you know I mean British people think Americans are idiots and you know what okay I, I think there's obviously ignorance over here and there are problems when it comes to the media and so on but American people are good and you have to understand the difference between the people and the societies and structures and and political system and the leaders that they have and how people are controlled and and um, influenced and you know there are various different assemblages in, in all of our societies that are working against people most uh, in many ways um, we can create a better society and we can challenge these structures and it's so important to have faith in people thank you everybody bye bye <laughs>